five kilometers away from the nearest coastline, this massive ship is a jarring reminder of one of the worst natural disasters in human history. Ten years ago, on this day, a 15-meter wall of water swept away not only this ship, but most of the surrounding city of Banda Aceh, as well as hundreds of other villages and communities around the Indian Ocean coastline. I'm Taymor Nabili, and on this special edition of Between the Lines, we'll take a look at the events of the 26th of December 2004. In the next 60 minutes, we'll examine some of the lessons learned from the catastrophe. Is Asia prepared for the next big one? We'll also look at how agricultural land ruined by seawater is being made productive again, and at the historic peace deal in Aceh, signed as a result of this disaster. What's the progress? For future generations, and for those who were not here on December the 26, 2004, the entryway of the Aceh Tsunami Museum stands as a very visceral introduction to the horrors of that day. Of an estimated total of some 250,000, more than 170,000 of the people who died in the tsunami came from the province of Aceh. No wonder then that so much of the focus of rebuilding and rehabilitation also took place here. But how effective was that process? What went right and what went wrong? On my panel today, I have three veterans of Asia's disaster management community. Saeed Faisal, on my right, is the executive director at the ASEAN Consulting Center for Humanitarian Assistance on Disaster Management, known as AHA. Said was also the deputy head of Indonesia's Rehabilitation and Reconstruction Agency, known as BRR, which was set up after the 2004 tsunami. Beate Trunkman is the country director of the United Nations Development Program, the UNDP, in Indonesia. She was previously its deputy resident representative in Sri Lanka. And Hassan Ahmad is director of philanthropy and sustainability at HSL Constructor, a marine civil engineering group. It's part of a coalition of private sector firms that helps victims in the event of regional disasters. He's also helped to start two of Singapore's leading regional humanitarian NGOs, Mercy Relief and Leon Aid. He served as their chief executive. Thank you all for being here today. Nice to have you here. Saeed, let me begin with you. You were heavily involved and have been ever since the tsunami. Tell me your story of the past 10 years. What has been successful? What has been unsuccessful? What could have been done better in the subsequent decade after that disaster? I think it's a tsunami, a check tsunami for the case. It's, uh, it's not like just a disaster, it's a, a mega disaster where usually after a mega disaster you expect the change of uh, landscape of uh, humanitarian, you expect the change of uh, how people do things and then you expect as well the change of mindset because people being struck by a real disaster. Ten years ago, uh, in this province for example, uh, not many people are aware what the tsunami is all about. But now, I think everyone aware. Uh, we talk in disaster, the best way to mainstream the disaster is when the disaster happening in that particular part of the country. And here we are surrounded by children being taught exactly the lessons exactly. of that disaster. So it's uh, a lot of uh, things being learned. We're talking about the awareness of the people about the disaster. We're talking about the preparedness and the rehabilitation, reconstruction that we can see now. Definitely this is not uh, what it was when we started the rehabilitation reconstruction uh, about uh, 10 years ago. Berta, you were doing a lot of work in Sri Lanka post tsunami. Are the experiences in different countries different? Are there different lessons to be learned? No, I would say uh, I think the, the lessons are fairly similar and uh, the tsunami certainly in both countries uh, changed as uh, Faisal was saying. The, the landscape of disaster management and disaster risk uh, reduction in both countries and you see nowadays a very different approach both in Sri Lanka but uh, in Indonesia also in how disaster management is being approached it's basically being approached uh, as a comprehensive uh, effort uh, looking at issues from before during and after disaster how you manage and 
mainstreaming disaster management and disaster risk reduction. Is this a realignment of process following the tsunami? Absolutely, absolutely. And Indonesia has, you know, in Indonesia this has triggered also a reorganization of the institutional landscape. There was a 2007 uh, act, a bill, legislative bill on disaster management which led to the establishment of a dedicated agency, national agency for disaster management, BNPB as we call it here. And that agency is tasked with the end-to-end -end management of disaster management. As I said, from preparedness to, to uh, uh, relief and response and building back uh, better. All right, so we've had a change in priorities. We've had a change in theoretical processes. You work closely on the ground at every level. Have we had a change in practice? Have we seen material benefits derived from the lessons learned? I think there, there is some tweaking uh, in the humanitarian ecosystem. You know, after in the aftermath of the 2004 tsunami, uh, if you look at the from the civilian sector, you know, uh, the NGOs, uh, for example, the, they have uh, they, are, they have come together to be more structured as a coalition. Uh, AHA plays a very active role in the APG or the uh, ADMA partnership group, which has brought together uh, uh, leading NGOs from the 10 ASEAN countries to come together, work with the AHA Center, you know, for uh, uh, disaster responses uh, uh, in the region uh, of Southeast Asia. So uh, that's on the civilian front. And but you, but you use the word tweaking, which doesn't imply massive structural overhaul. Uh, not really, because Everyone was already functioning quite soundly then, uh, individually, you know, but uh, uh, to be more uh, cohesive, to be more structured in terms of approach rather than stumbling upon one another, uh, you know, when a major disaster occurs. Uh, from the military front, if you look at the ASEAN Regional Forum, uh, Forum uh, they have also included the HADR or the Humanitarian Assistance uh, Disaster Response into their mandates. So, you know, th things, uh, the whole entire ecosystem has changed a little bit, you know, in, ter in terms of uh, uh, wanting for more structure uh, to be put in place. Uh, in terms of, if you look at the uh, 2004 tsunami, it was a little bit chaotic on the ground. Of course, the, the whole scale of dev uh, devastation was massive. You know, but what we are looking here is, you know, there is no uh, real or proper coordination. And the establishment of AHA uh, is something that uh, we all are looking forward to in terms of, you know, how uh, uh, things can be better coordinated, managed, and then also uh, avoid the duplication of efforts, uh, which, you know, can avoid uh, wastage of resources. This is one of the key elements. I mean, AHA set up as a coordinating body and not simply uh, as a loose affiliation of, uh, of like-minded people. Is This is actually uh, a properly funded and uh, structured uh, organization. But my first question to you is going to be, why did it take so long? I mean, AHA itself, the agreement on disaster management uh, appeared very soon after the tsunami. Yes. But it wasn't ratified for five years and your organization uh, only a couple of years after that. It's a, a, a agreement is a process where every country will need to agree on all the single uh, word. Uh, but the first agreement, the ASEAN agreement on disaster management, the process of uh, ratification, that is what uh, agreed by the 10 country, uh, you know, take uh, several years. The agreement for the AHA Center, uh, for example, another agreement, take uh, lesser time uh, than that one. So it's a process because in ASEAN, when we talk about the ratification, it might go to the members of the parliament of each of the country. Uh, it's not just a decision of a meeting. It's a mechanism that all the 10 countries agree to follow. Uh, so when we talk about the AHA Center as the coordinating center on uh, disaster management and humanitarian response, it has a, a mandate, it has the structure, it has the mechanism, it has the uh, SOP, it has all necessary things that the organization needs to coordinate and to execute. But what, I, what I'd like to know, and again, let's take an on-the-ground perspective, is how much uh, are the political aspects uh, that, uh, that we're hearing about still determining and perhaps hampering the real uh, work on the ground, the, the real necessary work to get the aid to the places that need it as soon as possible? Well, just, 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 as, as a practitioner, you brought up the criticism. Well, I suppose this is where, you know, you, you need uh, associations like the ASEAN, you know, where already at the political level, people are, there's already an existing goodwill, 
relationship. And I think the re relationship is the one that is most important when it comes to uh, going into someone else's uh, uh, backyard or home and to, uh, to extend assistance, you know. So while, uh, and AHA for that matter, you know, talking about political, AHA has the political legitimacy in this case, you know, to be the, the coordinator for uh, uh, agencies in, uh, in the region and also within the ASEAN nations. On, on an international scale, tell me how that fits in, AHA and its relationship with the UN and the politics surrounding that kind of uh, relationship. Well, you know, I mean, the first point I, I actually wanted to make, if you uh, allow me, is that uh, I think one of the good lessons, actually, from the Aceh tsunami recovery was the recognition that coordination is absolutely vital across different levels. And the, the Bureau for Reconstruction and Recovery, led by Pakontoro Mangu Subroto, and uh, Faisal was, of course, one of the deputies, I think was a good example of uh, uh, unitary, if you like, coordinating pla platform that really did bring all the actors together, had a clear mandate to lead and to, to execute with very far-reaching powers reporting directly to the president, having uh, extraordinary uh, powers such as you know, being able to do visa clearance, for example, on the ground here, getting customs clearance directly, cutting right through the bureaucracy. And so I think the coordination between the various actors, humanitarian and uh, 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 the longer term uh, relief and recovery, were actually worked actually quite well in, in the case of Aceh because of that institutional setup. The other point to make, I think, is that we oftentimes talk about this dichotomy, if you like, between um, humanitarian assistance and then the, the recovery and development phase kicking in. And I think that's another point, actually, where Aceh got it right because there wasn't, uh, there was a very seamless transition. There wasn't a gap between the two phases. In the case of Aceh, uh, the recovery kicked in very early on while the relief phase was still ongoing. And that basically allowed, you know, for longer term development co uh, considerations to also be uh, mainstreamed, as you like, or, or considered as part of the relief and then the early recovery effort. And to your question, AHA, of course, as a center at as a, at the regional level is, is providing that type of coordination of a concerted effort between countries that you would want to see. So clearly a value addition for me there from that perspective. How important do you think it is that AHA does have this regional identity, that ASEAN has got its act together on a regional level? I think it's a, a very clear example that we are talking about the 2015 of the ASEAN community. And that must be reflected not only in the economy, but also in the disaster management in our uh, point of view. So that's why we are launching what we call the One ASEAN, One Respond as part of uh, responding to One ASEAN community. Uh, but as uh, Bete mentioned about the coordination at any level, coordination is always important. We're talking at the country level, we're talking at the national level, we're talking at the regional level, which is more AHA Center will play the role, and we're talking at the uh, international level where the UN agency will uh, play the role. But I also want to add that <clears throat> coordination post-emergency is a challenging game and uh, people were always expecting a smooth uh, coordination during uh, emergency in the large disaster with a lot of uh, players uh, stepping in to assist, that's definitely not the easy one. I want to ask each of you what you think is the most important priority that remains now to be achieved. Ten years on, what do we still need to do? Well, I, I think the, you know, uh, there's a lot of development, as I said, the ecosystem has grown, you know, and also has changed. But uh, the one, there are three sector players, you know, in, in we feel, you know, they're the public sector, the people sector, and also the private sector, you know. Uh, while the public sector, uh, which the government, uh, you know, and also the U United Nations and, and, and the people sector, the NGOs, uh, there's one uh, significant uh, missing link here, uh, you know, where the private sector, you know, where uh, if you look at the, the Aceh tsunami, or even in Sri Lanka, right, uh, the most effective component of the relief operations is actually the military, right, because they are structured, 
Let me, let me stop you there for a second because I want to get into exactly this issue in just a second after the break, the evolving structures of the aid communities and particularly the private sector involvement. So we'll come on to that in a second. Beate, what, for you, what, what is the, significant, the single most significant thing that needs to be done next? You know, I would say Adshi has come a very long way and that aspiration of building back better has, has materialized. It's, it's a completely different place to what it was from before. I think the recovery effort was one, you know, uh, of great significance and very successful given especially also its size, $7.2 billion, you know, worth of uh, relief and recovery implemented in, in an efficient and transparent uh, uh, manner from a development perspective and that's of course how UNDP looks at things as a, the United Nations uh, agency in charge of development. I think what needs to happen is indeed, you know, bringing the private sector into development more and basically making sure that we have an engine of growth in, in Aceh that can translate into gainful employment, into sustainable livelihoods, uh, etc. Beyond Aceh though as well, I mean the entire ASEAN project that you're involved in, you tell me what your priorities are next. We should see uh, the change of the humanitarian landscape. Uh, in the future. I think, for example, from the regional perspective, the establishment of the AHA Center by ASEAN is heading to that direction. Now there is emerging factors, what we call the regional organization, also taking place. Uh, and then, as uh, mentioned uh, by Hassan and Beati as well, the private sectors, also we see that getting more and more involved. Now, when we talk about the private sector, it's not only about funding, uh, but it's more on the experience, the expertise, and most importantly, the innovation in the humanitarian sector. We'll touch on exactly those issues in just a minute. We're going to have to take a short break. We'll come back in a moment and talk about the evolving framework and structures of disaster management, particularly the involvement of the private sector in the industry. Stay with us. Welcome back to this special edition of Between the Lines, where we're discussing the lessons learned 10 years after the Indian Ocean tsunami disaster. And uh, we're moving on now to discuss some of the evolving structures of disaster management, and particularly the involvement of the private sector. Hassan, you work for the private sector, for a corporation that is spending a lot of money and a lot of resources and a lot of uh, intellectual uh, buy-in to the idea that private sector has a huge role to play in disaster management. So just give us a bit of a background on what your company is trying to do and why the private sector is important. Uh, we've uh, developed this uh, new uh, organization called the Corporate Citizen Foundation, and uh, it's, which is actually to be the platform where more uh, where private sector companies you know, can actually uh, come on board. right? Uh, share their expertise, share their experience, share their uh, assets, you know, uh, especially during, uh, di uh, for disasters. Uh, because if you look uh, back at most of the major disasters for the last 10 years, right, a lot of uh, 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 more successful and effective uh, uh, agencies that have gone in are actually the militaries. Right? And, this is and is, isn't, isn't this the point? I mean, isn't the role of disaster management uh, a humanitarian, uh, nation-level role supposed to be down to government, to things like the military? Why do we need private sector? Well, the private sector also uh, forms part of uh, nation building uh, for every country. You know, they, 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 they contribute, you know, to the, the, to the development of the countries, right? And that's where actually where the monies are. You know, and and most of the, uh, especially modern day businesses, right? You have uh, offices and businesses, you know, in the countries around, you know, all beyond the region that the, the where the company is based in. So the thing is, if you look at the the past disasters, the militaries have been the most effective because they are structured and they have the assets, and these assets actually lie in the domain, the private sector domain, like uh, jets, air assets. If you talk about landing ship tanks, we have the landing craft. Of course. I mean, there are plenty of assets in the private sector, of course, and money and dedication uh, as well. But one of the problems that we always seem to face in disaster situations is the uh, existence of too many actors, isn't it? I mean, we've always got 
any number of NGOs from UN level global institutions to two or three man uh, bodies that want to just come in and help. Isn't the involvement of private sector just complicating the issue even more? You know, to me, it's, it's, it's really a question of uh, complementarity, basically, and how you coordinate. Uh, and definitely the private sector has a role to play, even in, you know, the humanitarian phase, which may actually not be that obvious. But, you know, as, as we were saying, I mean, uh, logistics, for example, you know, aircraft, etc., right? Standing capacities that the private sector could lend to a, a humanitarian operation, I think, are useful if well coordinated. And that's precisely the point. You know, if you have the institutional framework in place, to make sure that you get that synergy between actors, then I think it's it's good to pull in and uh, draw on as many uh, forces as you can. Obviously, for the for the recovery phase and uh, the development phase, the private sector is absolutely vital because they are, as I said before, the engine of growth. They are the the actor that will generate employment, and uh, the the earlier they can do that, and the earlier we involve them and get people back on their feet, you know, winding them, winding, winding them off uh, aid, the better, because you give people back a sense of normalcy. So I, I, I fully agree, there is a, a, a very vital role of the private sector to play. It's a question of how the political actors, including national actors, but also the United Nations, which has a role for the international uh, coordination oftentimes in these efforts, how we come together and coordinate the efforts of different actors. This obviously is one of the big challenges on your plate. I mean, the way we see this is the disaster, disaster response, disaster management should not just be the responsibility of the government. Uh, because in some cases, it really directly impacts the private sector. The flood in Thailand, for example, impacted private sector, billions of dollars. So, uh, when we talk about the private sector's involvement, in the view of uh, what they can also bring is the innovation side. Because private sector, when we talk about innovation, that's where the field. So, what responding to your question about the complexity, because we get more actors, mm. it's, we always say that a disaster, particularly the big scale, it always has a DNA of a complex, chaotic, confusing environment. This is why we call it disaster. If we take this out, we cannot call it disaster anymore. It's become maybe a family reunion or something. But that will always be there. But what is important when we providing assistance is about understanding the thin line between our assistance becoming an asset or a liability for the government. That's where the coordination will take place. That's where the importance of the government is the one that's taking the lead. Let me flip around the question that I asked Hassan. I asked him whether it shouldn't be government job to handle this stuff. Let me flip it around. Should, the, should there be more private sector involvement? Should it be almost entirely private sector? Because we have resources, we have money in the private sector. Are they doing enough? And how do we encourage them to do more? It's, again, the best uh, way to see this one if the private sector has been impacted. Then they will, no, let, let's say the, 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 the trend in the private sector is talking about the business continuity plan because disaster already hit mm. some of the factors and everyone talking about a business continuity plan. But as any other thing, it's a process. So it might take time, the private sector will get more in, involved, but I'm a strong believer the involvement of private sectors, their knowledge, their expertise, the capacity, the resources will add positively to the humanitarian landscape. Is there ever a situation where there's too much money, where there's too much involvement? I mean, you talked uh, earlier on about the, the concept of building back better. I mean, there are people who criticize that as a concept. They say, why are we striving to create ideal communities in disaster areas rather than simply getting people back on their feet and back to work? Well, you know, the idea of building back better, a lot of it is about making sure that you are better prepared for a disaster next time around when it strikes. And it will strike in countries like Indonesia that are sitting, you know, on the ring of fire and between tectonic plates. So basically that idea is making sure that when you build back, you decrease 
the risk of exposure to disaster rather than increasing it and making sure, for example, that you have seismic uh, uh, proof building right. and that, you know, may take a little more money both in terms of planning and making sure that you have state-of-the-art facilities, but it's a future, it's, invest, it's an investment into the future, if you like. We have had the next one since the, uh, since the tsunami. We've had any number of natural disasters here in Asia. Have they been handled better? Well, much better coordinated. Uh, if you look at the Southeast Asia floods in 2011, you know, a lot of uh, the players right, have gone into there. The AHA Centre uh, has sent the IRAD team in, you know, and then to work with the local government of Thailand, right, uh, and also Cambodia. And I, I thought it was uh, much better because we were personally down on the ground and we thought it was much, much better coordinated. But that said, uh, are we, would we be ready for a larger scale than this one? You know, if the, the next big thing hits, everyone is uh, uh, second-guessing Padang for the next big one, mm. you know. So, but how much are we uh, better prepared than if, you know, Padang were to be hit? Uh, you know, in time to come, right? Uh, but uh, the recently the Singapore uh, the Singapore Armed Forces they launched the uh, RHCC or the Regional Humanitarian Coordinating Center. I think mean, on the military front, you know, they are they are still strengthening themselves. On the civilian front, also, I think this is where we need to put in more efforts and get in more players on board. Again, like what uh, Beate said, coordination is key, I, and I think we all know that. Mm -hmm. You know, that's uh, the fundamental of get, mm -hmm. getting, sh making sure that things uh, are, are, are gotten right. How do we make sure that coordination is better organised? And specifically, is it uh, reaching the point where we need to think about having coordination locally organised by organisations like AHA or even more devolved local institutions, rather than global level things like the UN? Well, again, you know, I think that is uh, one of the encouraging signs in, uh, in Indonesia because, as we were saying before, the institutional landscape actually for disaster management has changed dramatically since the tsunami. Indonesia has established, as I was saying before, uh, a national disaster management agency that is charged with the entire cycle of uh, disaster management. And importantly, those structures which are charged also with coordination have been replicated at provincial level. So we have provincial disaster management agencies in all the 34 provinces. We're rolling this out, Indonesia is rolling this out now to district level, precisely to enhance coordination uh, both in terms of the preparedness but also the response. And I think we have seen things improving. For example, when the uh, uh, Mount Merapi eruption happened in Jogjakarta in 2010, that wasn't a small-scale disaster that affected hundreds of thousands of people. The Indonesian government was able to handle that, you know, on its own, with their own capacities, using basically the in in institutional infrastructure that has been built. And it goes back to the point of, you know, how are we actually reducing vulnerability? And the issue there is you need to reduce it on the ground with the communities building back better, but you also need to make sure that you are better prepared. Because we know from the figures that, you know, investing one dollar in preparedness will save you seven dollars in relief and recovery money. So it's a wise investment and I think that's exactly where the debate in Indonesia and internationally is heading and I, I can see that there are improvements. Now, if there is a huge scale disaster, of course, you know, you, there will be a certain degree of chaos to be addressed. And that's, that's obviously going to happen. We have disasters in this part of the world on a, a disturbingly frequent basis. How much remains to be done to prepare for the next one and the one after that? I, I think uh, I'll, I'll lead, uh, continue with the, the coordination. Uh, the, when you say how do we strengthen the coordination, then the, the ASEAN, the AHA Center now, is a platform for coordination not only for civilian but also for uh, military, private sectors and others. So this is more moving toward inclusive coordination platform where AHA Center will work with the military as well as part of the coordination. Build Back Better, if I may uh, give example, is exactly the place that we are having this interview. Three days after tsunami, when I personally came to this place, this place, this is the last place that we can move forward because this already full with mountain of debris. Today, 
Now we have a tsunami museum. Now we are talking about build back better from a debris to infrastructure, but at the same time we are talking about build back better in terms of knowledge. We see children visiting tsunami museum, so now the knowledge can be passed to the next generation. So when we talk about build back better, it's about technical, the soft side, the hard side is a comprehensive. It's about building a better uh, human development. Human That's development. a perfect place to leave it and we can hear the kids gathering uh, and taking their lessons. We can hear preparations uh, for the celebrations to mark the 10th anniversary happening around us. Uh, but we'll leave our panel discussion here for the moment. We won't stop the discussion overall though because we're going to take this from the museum and out into the field quite literally and tell you about how the efforts are proceeding to win back the agricultural land that was polluted by the seawater and the debris. Stay with us. The tsunami wave that swept through this Aceh farmland back in 2004 was as high as the palm trees, according to the local farmers. It came from one kilometer away in the coastline, ending up at the foot of the hills in the distance there. And when it had receded, all that remained was silt and mud and debris. Christian Budi Unifit is with the UN Development Programme and has been working on this land ever since that tsunami wave came through. What was left here? Well, basically, uh, when the tsunami came, everything was destroyed. All of the farmland here, about 300 hectares of farmland here destroyed by the tsunami. And the farmers couldn't have their livelihood back at the time. When you say destroyed, I mean, it wasn't simply swept away, right? I mean, there was yes. millions of cubic meters of debris and mud. Sediment, and sail, yeah. How, how much of this area was actually put under, under debris? Uh, the height of the debris that we, when we did the, the assessment, it's about 30 centimeters high. Mm -hmm. I mean, from the, the, the original land, is about 30 centimeters high. And, and that meant that nothing could be planted? No, no one. No, because the, the saline level is quite low, okay. and with the salty and no, no, basically just grass and bushes, something like that, that, that would grow. And so, way. faced with that, mm -hmm. what was your challenge, and how did you face it? Yeah. <clears throat> Back in sometimes in 2009, right after the rehabilitation and reconstruction finished, uh, we found out that the farmers are very keen to back to their own livelihood at the mm -hmm. time. So basically some information we got from the BRR and then the Rehabilitation and Reconstruction Agency, they said that uh, could we uh, support the local farmers to get back to their livelihood. So we did some assessment with the BRR to find out where are the location that the farmers uh, originally works for the livelihood and we found this area about 300 hectares farmland destroyed and we communicate with the local communities here. Mm. Let, me, let me go back for a second. Mm. Um, so with 30 centimeters of, of mud and silt on this land, yeah. what was your task then? I mean, did you have to just clear that all away? How did you go about making this mm -hmm. farmable again? Yeah, we, well, the challenge is not just about to clear the area because we need to determine first the boundaries. Right. So we need to gather lots of information for the local communities, which are your land, which, which are the other lands, and then we basically form a group of the farmers and then they work together to agree, build a consensus. So they discuss with themselves and agree that, okay, let's determine that this piece of land is this belong to this person and the others belong. So basically they managed to <laughs> that when everything. Is that because the nature of the landscape, the yeah. actual uh, geography of this area was changed? Yes, exactly. Right. Exactly. Because as you see, between the the rice paddy field there is a little bit gap there. Mm. So basically that's are the boundaries that they need to determine at the time. Yeah. Okay, so you determined who belong, wh which bit of land belong to whom, mm -hmm. how are you going to apportion rights, mm -hmm. and then you have to make the land uh, arable again. Yes. How does one do that? Well, basically, this area is not uh, irrigated land, actually. This is basically a, a, a rain fed, mm -hmm. rain fed land. So, we provide some of, uh, like, a laboratory test for the land, uh, determine what, what is the level that this land can be planted again. And we work together with the local agricultural department here and they, they said that the, the, the amount of silt is this high and the unit basically need to clear this high of the breeze. <laughs> so 
Having done all of that, mm. how long has this been growing now? How long have the farmers been able to work this land? They've already been able to plant it right now. It's about, they already have three cycles right now since 2012, so it's only about, already about 18 months. Yeah. So 18 months mm. is, is when they started planting this. Yes. So basically we've had eight years, eight and a half years where this land has been unusable. Yes, exactly. Why does that take so long? Well, because at the time, most of the farmers, they become the victim of the tsunami, right? And mm. then they also become the construction workers. You know, there's plenty of construction uh, uh, project happening here after, right after the tsunami for the housing, the buildings, and they change their livelihood. Once the construction finished and they want to go back to their own life, then they start to treat So it wasn't simply the fact that the land was ruined, yes. it was their lives were disrupted to such an extent that they couldn't actually farm even mm. if they wanted to, because yes. they were busy doing other things. Yes. Interesting. Yes. Let's, let's talk to one of them. Yeah, we will meet with Pa Kachi Faisal. He is actually one of the community leader at the time who helped us uh, getting the community, having us a community organization for mm. the land clearance, and he also one of the farmers affected by the tsunami. Yeah. Can we speak to him? Yeah. Sure. We can I can call him. Pak Kaci. Mari sini dulu Pak Kaci. Kita ngobrol-ngobrol Pak Kaci. Ya. Apa kabar Pak Kaci? Baik. Can we ask him his life now back to the way it was before the tsunami? Okay. Eh uh, Pak Kaci, gimana setelah kembali berladang ini sudah kembali pulih lagi penghidupan sekarang sudah sudah ya sangat senang kami oh. dengan ciptanya bahwa apa sawah kembali oh, oke okay. ya 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 yeah, he said that he's very happy that now he can return to his original livelihood and gain more income as well and even produksinya lebih bagus ya dari lebih bagus, sebelumnya lebih bagus even? bisa bisa jual dulunya sebelum tsunami nggak bisa jual padahal oh, okay. sekarang habis <laughs> bisa jual <laughs> he said that he, even the production now is better before than tsunami yeah. What was he doing in the years between the tsunami and when he could start planting again? Okay. Sebelum habis tsunami, kira-kira apa nih kegiatan Pak Kecik? Kan nggak bisa bercocok tanam waktu itu, nggak bisa berlanjut. Habis tsunami. Hmm. Sehabis tsunami, sebagian masyarakat itu uh, kerja di pembangunan rumah, pembangunan hmm. god, uh, pembangunan yang lain-lain pokoknya. Hmm. Apa jalan, uh, ikut itu. Selain itu, kalau Pak Kecik sendiri? Kalau saya sendiri itu bertani terus itu. Saya bikin kebun. Oh, saya saya di, tidak di, tidak tunggu sawah direhab. Di, bikin di, kebun itu, bikin kebun. Di, di rumah ya? Enggak, enggak, enggak di rumah. Di, di 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 ini sawah yang dulunya sawah saya jadikan kebun. Hmm, 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 hmm. Tanam di, kacang, tanam jagung, tanam cabai. Di di sini? Iya, di lamanya. Di lamanya. Oh, Oke. Okay. Oke. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. So Christian this is one success story, one okay. life rebuilt mm -hmm. after the tsunami. But how common is his story? Are there uh, others around here who've not been quite so lucky in getting back to where they were? Well, uh, frankly speaking, that some of the area is not yet been clear. But basically, the, re the main reason of that is because most of the farmers become the victims. Mm. But in common, they are ri right now already having their own livelihood back and gain more income for the families and I think most of the farmers around have better life than before. Is yeah. the UNDP work here now done? Yes, exactly. We conclude our activities here in December 2012. Yeah. And so the effects of the tsunami, at least for this region and the farmers here, mm. have now been solved. Yes, exactly. In Thank you region. so much, Christian. You're welcome. <laughs> We'll take a short break now. When we come back on this Between the Lines special, we'll talk about the one positive aspect that came from the 2004 tsunami, the way it managed to bring an end to the long-running political conflict here in Aceh. Stay with us. In 2004, this mosque was one of the few structures that remained standing in the Indonesian city of Banda Aceh after much of the rest of the surroundings were devastated by the Indian Ocean tsunami. But those same waves also had one positive impact. They served as the catalyst for a peace deal between the province of Aceh and the government in Jakarta. Ten years on, our senior Southeast Asia correspondent Sujadi Siswo examines whether the terms of that deal are being met. The peace accord signed in Helsinki in 2005 brought a bloody 30-year-old conflict to an end. Over 150,000 lives were lost in the war 
between the Free Aceh Movement or GAM and Jakarta. After the signing of the deal, former separatist leaders took over the running of the provincial government. The agreement between Jakarta and GAM heralded peace and security in the province. Its economy, once wrecked by the three decades of conflict, has begun to show promise. But there's discontent among former separatists, particularly those who have yet to benefit economically from the deal. It's made worse by the split among former GAM leaders who are now heading the provincial government. I caught up with Zakaria Hussein, a former GAM field commander, who chose not to join any of the political parties set up by his former comrades. Zakaria is among former separatists who are frustrated that the peace deal has not brought prosperity to the province. Saya ada bilang ada baca undang-undang dulu Helsinki, dikasih rumah, dikasih kerja, dikasih petani, dikasih sawah, dikasih kebun itu tidak ada sampai sekarang. Hanya ada kita merasakan keyamanan. Kemanyanan itu aja. Lainnya tidak. Sama saja nol. Karena mereka itu yang baru bermain politik, itu sangat terasa bagi masyarakat. Itu karena tidak ada kemakmuran sedikit pun. Siapapun gubernur sudah ditaruh, tidak ada kemakmuran untuk rakyat. Dulu, kita sudah berjanji dan sudah dibantu oleh masyarakat. Ya kan? Cukup baik kita dengan masyarakat. Ternyata, apa yang dikomongkan dulu, oleh GAM kepada masyarakat ini sekarang mereka masyarakat mendudut ke mana yang ngomong dulu kenapa enggak enggak ada wujud-wujudnya hingga GAM-GAM komandan-komandan lain malu dengan dekat dengan masyarakat sekarang bahkan dirinya sembunyi-sembunyi kalau di depan masyarakat begitu karena kan kita punya ada wilayah punya daerah punya sago masing-masing kan di situ mereka yang tuntut-tuntut mereka telepon kita setiap hari minta bantuan minta tolong kita mana ada the political split among GAM leaders has turned friends into foes there have been reported cases of attacks and killings among former separatists who are believed to be still keeping the weapons they use during the conflict. Kita sama-sama KPA, KPA itu masih kayak biasa kalau dengan saya. Tapi ada juga kawan-kawan kita sudah masuk ke partai-partai lain. Itu enggak semuanya kita masih baik. Ada juga yang baik, ada yang enggak tidak. Tergantung kita pilih mereka. Peace may have been delivered, but it's clear that prosperity is still an unfulfilled promise for the Archies. We'll end today's program where our story first began. This used to be the village of Ulele, and this is the point where the 2004 tsunami wave first hit land. Anyone who was walking the seafront on that day would have been doing so some 200 meters in that direction. But there's a new coastline now and a new normal. And in future, anyone who's sitting on this coastline and has the misfortune of looking up and seeing a wave coming towards them, well, at least they will have the comfort of knowing that they are much, much better prepared on this occasion. This has been a special edition of Between the Lines. Goodbye.